Hello and greetings to you all and welcome to the final webinar of the West Africa Biodiversity and Climate Change Program, also known as WAP. This final webinar is on strengthening capacity for combating wildlife crime, increasing resilience to climate change, and reducing deforestation, forest degradation, and biodiversity loss. As you may all be aware, WAPIC is a five-year USAID funded program with the overall goal to improve conservation and climate resilient low emission growth across West Africa. By the way, my name is Emilia Arthur, and I'm your moderator for this final webinar of WABIC. WABIC went on three core areas. One, combating wildlife crime. Two, increasing resilience to climate change. And three, reducing deforestation, forest degradation, and biodiversity loss. Ladies and gentlemen, as you may be aware, WABIC worked with three key partners, ECOWAS, MRU, and Abidjan Convention, working across transboundary landscape in West Africa. As part of the activities marking the end of the WABIC program in West Africa, a number of activities have been undertaken. There have been three close out webinars that were held separately, each focusing on the three core areas. I have the pleasure of moderating the last and final webinar of WABIC as it comes to an end. The theme for this webinar conversation is, once again, ladies and gentlemen, strengthening capacity for combating wildlife crime, oh, that was nice. increasing resilience to climate change, and reducing deforestation, forest degradation, and biodiversity loss. I'd like to walk you through the format for this webinar. There are going to be three panel conversations. The, each panel conversation will start with a scene setter to set the scene for the conversation. This will be followed by three panel panelists expressing their views on the particular topic for conversation. There will be a brief Q&A to follow, and then we'll have a closer remark by the scene setter, and then we move on to the next panel conversation. At the end of it all, we will have a general Q&A and then final remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, please come along with me as I introduce the first panel discussion. The first panel conversation is on the topic, how has WABIC influenced policy reform for addressing biodiversity and climate change in West Africa? And to set the scene for us is Adeleke Adewale, who worked as the senior policy specialist for WABIC. Thank you, Wale. Over to you. Thank you very much, Amelia. And thanks to all our colleagues and uh, friends and conservation interested uh, individuals who have uh, joined us on this uh, West African Biodiversity and Climate Change final webinar. Uh, as Amelia said, uh, the, our main interest on this, uh, the first panel is how has WABIC influenced policies to solve reforms by addressing biodiversity and climate change in West Africa. We will look at influencing policy reform for addressing both biodiversity and climate change. And I would like to start by, first of all, taking you to the overall goal of WABIC, which is, as you all know, to, is to improve conservation and climate resilient low emission growth across West, West Africa. How do we approach uh, getting to uh, achieving this, uh, our laudable objective? Uh, I think uh, our mandate was from the USA West Africa that's decided that um, their approach to working is by using policy private loop. What do we mean by that? The idea is that if you want to influence policy, 
you can do it in, in two fronts. You can start from the site level and pull up the, the uh, activities you get from uh, the site level to influence policy at both national and regional level. Also, you can also do it by influencing, by starting at the regional level, uh, coming out with a regional policy, but which you can pull down to influence things that you can do both nationally and uh, uh, you can do both nationally and at the side level. You will hear about specific examples of um, what this means and how WABIC was able to do it through the presentation that will be made by our identified panelists. Um, I would like to call on my first panelist, Mr. Zibide Injisu. Zibide is now currently the Ramsar Convention, at the Ramsar Convention Secretariat, but was part of the WABIC team implementing Zebede will look into the changes in policies and legal frameworks that impacted regional bodies and specifically share his experience in linking Wabi climate change vulnerability assessment development to the Abidjan Convention protocols. I will call on Zebede to follow now. Thank you, uh, Dr. Adeleke, for uh, inviting me. And so to the question, I would like to be brief. And I would say WABIC has done a lot to influence policy across West Africa. But to be tangible, I would say uh, over this period, WABIC developed a, a management plan for the Shabo River estuary. They developed a national coastal climate change adaptation plan for Sierra Leone. And the uh, site experiences contributed to enriching the, uh, the protocols on sustainable management of mangroves, as well as integrated coastal zone management protocol developed by um, the Abidjan Convention. So how did WABIC do this? This looks uh, linear or straightforward when we look at the documents produced, but it is not. First of all, to arrive at this process, you need some concrete requirements. What are those needs? First, you need the right partnership. I think the WABIC team was, uh, from the very onset, um, good with identifying the right partners. And defining the right partner partners meant identifying low-hanging fruits. They found that in Abidjan Convention, and also putting together the right team, as well as mobilizing and working well with the donors to be flexible and understanding the process of uh, this very complex process. So those were the key issues, but what really happened? The vulnerability, the climate change vulnerability assessment that was conducted by WABI was an opportunity to identify the gaps. And this gave us an opportunity to answer the question, is climate change affecting the coast of Sierra Leone? The answer was yes. What evidence do we have to prove? We identified that mangroves were depleting at a rate of 1% annually. People were losing their livelihoods, floods, saltwater intrusion, why were these things happening? Those were the gaps that we set out to fill over this time. It meant that we had to identify the right partners at the local level, basically doing a 
a stakeholder analysis, identifying things that were missing. Sierra Leone did not have any policy on wetlands or mangrove management. Over this time, we moved towards filling that gap. We added value to this by not only remaining at the level, at that national level, but pulling up our experience, as uh, Dr. Wale said, to the regional level by feeding those principles that have been developed by the Abidjan Convention on what was practical and what was not practical. So I would like to stop there for now because there's a lot to say. And if there are any questions, we'll answer as we go. Wale, can you invite your second yeah, that's, part? That's fantastic of you. I love that. That's exactly what I want to do. Uh, I'm now calling on our, and this is uh, Dr. Wale is the, the Deputy Secretary General of the Mano River Union. Uh, uh, and uh, he is uh, going to be able to go to, talk through the experience that uh, the Manu River you know, has uh, in uh, sharing, uh, in uh, developing their, revising their strategy and how it has influenced the knowledge uh, uh, from the field to inform changes at the policy and legal frameworks. Dr. Tarawale. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Wale, and thanks to the previous speaker and good day to all. Like Dr. Wally said, the Mano River Union uh, will gain a lot from the Wabi pro project, and we hope and pray that the next phase of the webinar, they will, they, they will be able to get this project up and running again. To start with, when we came on board, we inherited a strategic plan that was a 10-year strategic plan, 2010 to 2015, and with strong support from Wabi we are able to develop a revised or a new strategic plan. And what this new strategic plan did for us was that it took into consideration the development plans of the four member states, that is Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. And also took into consideration the UN SDGs 2030 agenda, as well as the AU 2063 agenda, and then the, the ECOWAS agenda as well. So it's a mixture of both national, regional, and international perspective that was taken into consideration. A consultant was hired that brought together all these ideas and then developed our strategic plan. And the good thing is this strategic plan became the document of the member states. They validated this document and then approved its implementation. And most of these activities are in tandem with the development aspiration of the member states. And most of our activities have been implemented by the member states. So there's a kind of value addition to our program activities based on the strategic plan. In addition, they also help us to develop a communication strategy. And this communication strategy bodes well for the MRU and the member states. And this document has been extensively reviewed by member states, and they have also incorporated components of this strategic plan into their national development policies for implementation in 2021, 2022 in most of these countries. And quite recently, we are on the verge of concluding on the resource mobilization strategy, which again was initiated and developed with support from, the, from WABIC. And this again has to be shared with the member states, both at the technical level and at the ministerial level. The MRU has an organogram structure based like the highest body is the heads of states summit. Beneath the heads of state summit, we have the Union Ministerial Council made up of ministers of finance, ministers of integration, ministers of regional integration, ministers of agriculture. And beneath that, we have the technical committees. So most of these documents that have been 
proposed or have been developed with support from the WABIC, they go to the technical committee. Once they have been validated, we escalate these documents to the ministerial council for decision making. And most of these decisions or recommendations contained in some of these documents, especially the strategic plan, are taken on board by the ministers in the various countries and then also subsumed into their own into their own development plan. So by and large, it's a bi-directional causality show that most of our documents are being taken on board and our policies implemented. Another side, the, the WABICO has also played a great role is that they are statutory member of the Regional Steering Committee under the Jeff MRE project. That's a project for the ecosystem conservation and international water resource management co-financed by the IUCN. And WABIC has been very, very effective in transboundary water management. My colleague later, Dumbia, will throw more light on that, especially in terms of the Rome and other things. And another role the WABIC has also played is in terms of wildlife combating. The MRERs are structured, they call the Joint Border Security and Confidence Building Unit. We have about 38 border points within the Mano River Union. One is to combat wildlife trafficking, two, to avoid illegal smuggling of goods across the country, the various countries. And WABIC has played a key role in supporting MRE to enhance the capacity and the skills of this border security post, showing that they can be able to combat wildlife trafficking and then report to the secretariat for onward transmission to the authorities in the member states. So for now, I stop so far, and then if there are other issues, we'll discuss Thank that. You. Thank you, Dr. Robert. Yeah. I would like to call on uh, the third and last uh, panelist, Mr. Musa Leko. Musa, Le Musa Leko is a senior program officer with the Economic Committee of West African States, ECOWAS, and he will uh, talk through the experience that ECOWAS had in uh, translating the ECOWAS Forest Convergence Plan into uh, policy reforms, which happened both at the national uh, site level, national level, at the international level. Mr. Leko, please. Mr. Leko, are you with us? Hello, Mr. Leko. Are you with us? Um, Wale. Um, Wale. As we wait. Hello, Wale. Wale. Wale, if you can hear. Do you know what's happening with the Mr. Leko? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Emilia is just listening to Emilia. Yes. Yes. I hear you very well. I hear you very well. Uh, I just spoke with Mr. Leko just before the function started, and he was even asking me to key in. So he's on board. I don't know why he's not audible. So um, whilst we wait for Mr. Leko to join me, there's a question for Zebedee. Zebedee, there's a question for you. Um, question for Mr. Zebedee. How has the CCVA informed the Sierra Leone Climate Change Adaptation Plan? Can you speak to this, please? Thank you, Madam Moderator. That is a very useful question. Uh, as I said in my opening remarks, uh, what we present as indicators is very small compared to what was done initially. I'm very happy that Sierra Leone has taken up this um, opportunity to develop a national adaptation plan. But for the genesis, um, we start. The, it is WABIC that raised awareness in the country 
that this was needed. So that plan was needed. And how did we do that? We brought Sierra Leone and five other countries to Togo, where we, we, you know, we started at the national level by presenting the results of the, the, the vulnerability assessment. Then we took them to Togo, where we presented um, an opportunity to identify key issues affecting coastal areas, and then uh, what could be done to develop those uh, national adaptation plans. And then we introduced uh, Sierra Leone to NAP Global Network. It's a global entity that facilitates the development of national adaptation plans. And it is from there that the country picked that up, this opportunity. And NAP Global Network, Network has supported Sierra Leone in what they are currently doing. And in addition to that, our data and, and experiences have already been um, adopted and published by the country. And they are learning a lot from what we have done in terms of vulnerability assessment. So it's, um, it is a continuous process, as I can say, but I'm happy that they, are, they have taken this on board and they are actually doing something about it. We also trained the country uh, on climate information um, uh, development. So basically, the Sierra Leone has a lot of data that cannot be analyzed and transformed into information. So we organize a series of regional workshops where we train them on how to do that. And I'm sure that they, they are, they are, they are, their national ad adaptation plan is going to benefit a lot from this uh, uh, things that Wabik has done in the past. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Zebedee. Um, Wale. Hello, Wale. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Emilia. Okay, can you please um, ask, uh, get your other panelists to respond to um, some of the interesting things that he was talking about earlier? Yes, uh, Mr. Leko. If Mr. Leko is with us, can you please uh, uh, take, talk through your experience translating uh, ECOWAS Forest Convergence Plan to national level? If not, Dr. Buano, can you, can you do that Hello. quickly? Yeah, uh, hello, Mr. Leko. Hello. Yes. Oui, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> but, uh, yes. Hello. Hello. Yes, Musa, yes. speak. We are hearing. We are okay. Hearing. Go ahead, okay, Mr. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Wale, so for giving this opportunity uh, to talk about uh, how WABIC influenced the implementation of uh, the West African Forest Convergence Plan. So I think. Uh, uh, before that, I will explain the context uh, of the development of uh, uh, the uh, West African Forest Convergence Plan, uh, a process that started uh, in 2010 with to conduct assessment. Uh, of uh, the West African Forest Convergence Plan. So it's uh, the ministerial meeting in 2010 uh, held in Cotonou that uh, approved what we called the Zen uh, document uh, for the basis of dialogue on forests in West Africa. And at the same time, uh, adopts the term of reference for the development of the uh, West African Forest Convergence for the sustainable management of ecosystem and use. So uh, furthermore, in 2012, uh, there are uh, regional consultations that has been made and uh, which was validated by all the national stakeholders and it's Finally, 
in 2013 that the West African Forum, the Council of Minister of ECOWAS, as the strategic action plan uh, for addressing the issue. So it's uh, uh, made of uh, seven priority intervention areas. Uh, Noticeably, the first one is related to harmonization of legal uh, uh, legal uh, regulatory and the policies uh, related to forests in the subregion. The second one is related to uh, the uh, statutes of forests and the dynamic in uh, the region. The third one is related to conservation of uh, uh, forest and afforestation. The fourth one related to conservation of biodiversity, which is uh, which is conservation of uh, bi uh, biodiversity, which is uh, the fourth uh, priority intervention uh, area related to uh, the development of uh, the West African uh, strategy for combating wildlife trafficking. So uh, uh, I think uh, uh, in 2015, with the start, with the start of uh, the program, this program uh, uh, with WABIC, so uh, a lot of effort has been conducted under uh, the uh, support of uh, uh, WABIC project, uh, particularly related to this uh, component one, uh, an effort of uh, coordination meeting in July 2018 has been uh, uh, made to bring all the national uh, focal point of CITES uh, for a meeting of coordination uh, for uh, getting the priority intervention area for uh, developing the West African uh, uh, strategy for combating wildlife trafficking. So uh, in this way, uh, we can... In this way, we can, uh, we can mention uh, this was the most important steps, but I should mention also the assessment that has been conducted uh, by a national expert in uh, most of the countries, I've, I think uh, 14 out of the 15, uh, on the threat, uh, uh, the threat uh, uh, analysis conducted uh, on the biodiversity and the wildlife in this, uh, uh, the, the ECOWAS member states. Uh, has been one of uh, the key component that uh, bring together all uh, the national authority to support uh, the, the process. So uh, it's uh, after uh, this uh, regional coordination meeting, of course, that a small community of seven countries has been identified uh, to be the drafting committee of the strategy. And after a while, we know all the process that has been uh, gone through. It's uh, as a uh, technical validation. Mr. Taleko, you, uh, you have less than one minute. You, you have opportunity to than... answer questions, please. Okay, okay. so uh, I can wrap up. Uh, this draft uh, strategy so has been uh, uh, proof all the process of validation and adoption uh, for the statutory uh, meeting of ECOWAS. And finally, it's on uh, September two, 2000, uh, uh, September uh, 22nd, uh, 2000, 2020, that the ministers in charge of wildlife and forest uh, validate formally the strategy uh, the West African strategy for combating wildlife trafficking. So this is uh, 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 the 
process. It has been uh, long in description uh, right now. So we are on the step of uh, 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 the net to the net council of minister in June to submit it for the adoption of the council of uh, minister of equals. Thank you very much. So I can uh, answer some question uh, if needed, needed to be. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to our three panelists. Um, I, I want over to Emilia for follow-up. Thank you very much, uh, Wale, for leaving the scene for us, and thank you, uh, three panelists. Um, there is a question out there that I'd like um, uh, one of the panelists to look at immediately, and that question is looking at um, the question is that the project has come to an end. What adaptation plan or measures has been put in place for the coastal communities of Sierra Leone? thereby diverting their attention from mangrove destruction. Zebedi, are you able to take this? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think one uh, clarification that we need to make as development projects is most of the time to let um, stakeholders understand that we are coming in to help and not really taking over government responsibilities. And that is what we have tried, we tried to do over this time. So during that time, we tried to set up institutions with the understanding that WABIC was a, is a project and it will be ending. So that is why we developed a management plan, for instance, for the Shabo River estuary. That management plan outlines clearly the activities that needs to be put in place to reduce pressure on some of these resources. And so we created a national institution, the Coast uh, Achieved of Natural Resource Management Network, but also a local institution, the Shebro River Estuary Co-Management Committee. And we gave them various trainings, particularly on um, raising and uh, writing project proposals. But during the time of the project, we implemented a particular activity, that of uh, village savings and loans associations, which has enabled a lot of women to diversify their activities. In the last report I read, over the time of the project, communities has, had raised up to $100,000. Uh, that is a significant input to a society that yesterday, if you look at our baseline coastal climate change and vulnerability assessment, the access to, to loans were practically zero. Access to, to, to networks was practically zero. I think that is a good sustainability uh, asset. And plus, before, we, before I left uh, Sierra Leone, I introduced the country to the IUCN wetlands mangrove project that was just about establishing and directed them to the communities. And while I was away, I also helped the, the, the local as, uh, uh, institution that I had created to guide them in developing a proposal and they ended up submitting two proposals uh, during the call of the wetlands. Thank you so much, Zebedi, thank you. Um, time is always a, a, a challenge. I have two questions here, one from Anne and one from Rebecca. I'll take the one for Anne now. And the one for Rebecca, I want us to take it later when we bring the whole conversation to an end and we are looking at general, general questions because I think that will fit there better. Now, Anne Gardner has this question and I would like the two other panelists Mr. Leko and the other panelists to pay attention to this and give us some 30 seconds quick responses. And the question is this, recognizing that the five to six years of one project is not a long time when talking about biodiversity and climate change. Do you have a sense of how the policy reform supported by WAPIC may have had an impact on practice? 
or encouraged tangible action related to biodiversity and climate change. Mr. Leko and your other colleague, can you speak to this very briefly, 30 seconds each? Thank you very much. So I will try <clears throat> uh, to give some answer here. Yeah, indeed, uh, the time is uh, too, sh too short, five to six years. Uh, but uh, I think definitely on the policy, the policy reform uh, can have Im impact. Uh, hello? Hello? Yes, please go. Uh, yeah, the policy reform, I say, uh, can, have, uh, can have impact on the practices because uh, when you see uh, how at the regional level, the issue of uh, tackling uh, the uh, wildlife trafficking uh, has been uh, conducted before, uh, I'm sure uh, with uh, the capacity building, I mean the training of the 26 experts in the field of uh, CITES uh, uh, convention has boosted uh, the uh, capacities of uh, national uh, rangers and the national officers uh, in charge of the transboundary uh, control uh, uh, from border to borders. So I think uh, there is uh, a lot of example of uh, seizing or, or capture of uh, uh, traffickers or fraudulent poachers uh, uh, related to uh, the uh, wildlife uh, uh, trafficking uh, on uh, other, uh, I mean, uh, specimen uh, related to wildlife trafficking in the subregion. So this is what I can say. Uh, the impact uh, I think can be uh, on uh, 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 strengthening the good practices for tackling the issue of uh, wildlife trafficking. Uh, in the region. Thank you very Thank much. You. We'll, co we'll come back to have a fuller conversation because I think inherent in the strategy the project adopted is 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 is, is a value, is, is a, the impact, because this is where you see that working with regional partners helps national governments take on a particular strategy, and therefore the impact goes wider and broader than would have been if you were working with just one country. But we'll come back to this and have a fuller conversation. And um, I'm afraid we have to move on to the next panel. There are a number of interesting questions here. And rest assured, all your questions will be answered. There's a very interesting one that goes straight to the point. Question, when are we starting WABI 2, period? So now we move on to the next panel. I thank you very much, uh, Wale, for setting the scene for panel conversation one, and thank you to your panelists. Now, for panel question two, how has WAPIC strengthened institutional capacities in terms of policy and or technical for addressing biodiversity and climate change in West Africa? The first one was how WABIC influenced policy reform. And the second one is talking about strengthening institutional capacity for biodiversity and climate change in West Africa. To set the scene is Michael Balinga, the biodiversity conservation specialist on WABIC project. Michael, over to you. Thank you, Emilia. Capacity building can be formal or informal training. It can also be provision of knowledge, tools, or equipment. The exposure committees of character intervention was the systematic approach of going always going from a capacity needs assessment of institutions or issues to solutions for strengthening capacity including manuals, tools, and actual training or data. And this was done at regional, national, and local level. At the regional level, strengthening ECOWAS capacity to address CITES implementation, for instance, or Abidjan Convention's ability to strengthen its communication around coastal resilience issues are a few examples. 
at the national level, training wildlife staff or judiciary on how to fight wildlife trafficking was another example of what Wabeg did. But at the local level, training communities to implement mangrove restoration or to run self-help financial schemes and providing applications on phones, vehicles, and tools was a practical approach. We cannot detail everything here, but I think I will simply ask a few partners to provide their perspective of how they participated in these capacity building schemes and we can what we can learn from that. So first of all, I would like to invite Mr. Abu Bamba, Executive Secretary for the Abidjan Convention, who will tell us how the institutional, technical, organizational capacity assessments and the institutional, institutional strengthening plans that WABIC did contributed to establishing benchmarks and an enabling environment for effective partnerships and fundraising towards coastal resilience on Africa's Atlantic coast. Mr. Bubamba, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. I don't know whether you can see me. Um, I don't think so. Yes. No, but we can hear you very well. Oh, now we can see you and we can hear you. Okay, all right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, with regard to um, how the activities you know, carried out by WABIC towards the Abidjan Convention, how this has actually um, helped in improving the uh, institutional capacity of the Abidjan Convention so that we're able you know, to fulfill our roles and missions towards the uh, countries of the Abidjan Convention with regards to um, uh, improving the coastal resiliency, even combating wildlife uh, crime, marine wildlife crime. So first of all, uh, we need to recall the, um, the assessment, the institutional assessment. I think the uh, WABIC is very familiar with, uh, with that. Coming up and ask each and any staff of the Abidjan Convention, including the executive secretary, you know, what are the, uh, what is the situation? What are the issues that we're facing in terms of uh, both individual and institutional capacities? So once this uh, exercise was completed, we'll move, we'll change the gear and move towards uh, actually uh, coming up, you know, with solutions uh, on the basis of the assessment that it was made. So um, not to be very long, um, I will, I'm going to give a couple of, uh, of examples, you know, how uh, WABIC actually helped improving the, uh, the senior capacity of the Abidjan Commission. One typical example is the elaboration of uh, the, uh, the four protocols, uh, which are pretty unique. And I'm going to take only one of them, the one on uh, sustainable management of mangroves. You won't find it anywhere else in the world. You know, this is very unique, very typical. Uh, in the entire in the entire planet, having a protocol only on sustainable management of mangrove and uh, naming that protocol after the city of Calabar, uh, you know, uh, Cross River is a, is a state in uh, uh, Africa in Nigeria where they have I mean actually in Africa where they have the uh, last uh, uh, mangroves reserve you know in Africa the biggest actually in in Africa so we have this protocol which is now becoming the barometer, uh, which is now being domesticated in national legislations you know, throughout Africa. So this is one point that we should link to the um, uh, reinforcement of the institutional capacity of the, uh, of the Abidjan Convention by WABIC. Um, second thing that you know, we need to talk about is the framework of wildlife, I mean, combating wildlife crime. WABIC at the beginning you know, was focusing on terrestrial wildlife. And then we come and say, hey guys, look, we also have marine wildlife. You know, we have the manantes, you know, we have the dolphins, you know, we have the, the sharks and et cetera. People are using the theme, you know, in Asia to do stuff and Africa is suffering. And what we say, oh yes, why not? And then this has handed up, you know, to the preparation of a partnership, Abjin Commission partnership for combating marine uh, wildlife. And this is another concrete example of um, the, uh, uh, how WABIC has helped you know, 
securing or improving the institutional capacity of that gene convention so that we could play a major role you know, in the combat against marine and wildlife trafficking in our region. Uh, I know I only have uh, uh, three minutes, so I will um, say uh, maybe one last thing is on the resource center. Uh, information on marine and coastal is scattered you know, all of our different research centers, universities, and sometimes outside of Africa. And thanks to uh, what big contribution you know, when you say strengthening the institutional capacity is that making your institution able to us such a center where, I mean, the, uh, strengthening the convening power of your, of your institution, making sure that, you know, you can host the data, the information, the relevant data and information that can help, you know, policy formulation in terms of uh, marine and coastal uh, management in the, uh, Geography scope of the Abidjan Convention. I will conclude by the fundraising strategy. Uh, before Wabig, we didn't have a fundraising strategy. Uh, I haven't seen the final version of the document yet, but I know that Wabig colleagues and some consultants you know, in Ghana has helped with the preparation of a fundraising strategy, the fundraising uh, uh, strategy for the Abidjan Convention. So uh, we are now, I think somebody cut me off now. No. I proceed. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you can just round up uh, so we can okay, go on. I will, to the next I will just round up. So, uh, let me say something now. Uh, in terms of uh, how the uh, reinforcement of strengthening the institutional capacity of, of the Abidjan Convention Babic has led to more money, actually. Today, we are, we are like the, the, the main actor in the ocean debate in West, Central, and Southern Africa. And there are two or three more projects you know, and more money that came because of the reinforcement of institutional capacity of the Abidjan Convention. One of them is WAKA, West African Coastal Area. It's a big project of the World Bank, you know, in which the Abidjan Convention plays the role of regional integration. The second uh, project I would like to talk about is, I mean, we call it Mami Wata. I, I know it's not a, a good name, but it's a project you known marine coastal uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, Sierra Leone, Ghana, Benin, and Togo, where we are creating marine protected areas, you know, left and, and, and right. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, finally, uh, there's a project called MEA, Regional MEA Multilateral Environmental Agreement, funding by the European Union, you know, for 3 million euros, you know, for the Abidjan Commission. So without the reinforcement of the institutional capacity of the Abidjan, of the Abidjan Commission by WABI, this would not have been possible. So over. Thank you, Abu. So, so Abu, you were just talking about communities of practice and networking and how that helps us uh, do our job. I will link this to Guinea, where Wabik supported the Guinea government to link up with the Elephant Protection Initiative, thereby getting access to that community of practice. But what I would like to do now is invite Mr. Mamadou Bella Diallo, who is the focal point for the CITES Management Authority in Guinea, to tell us a bit more about how other aspects of capacity building helps Guinea, particularly the training on CITES at the master's degree level, and also short courses for judiciary and customs and other enforcement officers in Guinea. So Mr. Mamadou Bella, you have three minutes to give us your perspective on what Wabik brought to you in terms of capacity building in Guinea. Oui, merci et bonsoir pour tout le monde. Je, je reviens pour vous dire que la République de Guinée a ratifié la plupart des accords multilatéraux en matière d'environnement. Je prends un exemple sur la CITES. Et, et la Guinée a adhéré le 21 septembre 1981 et qui a été ratifié le 20 décembre 1981. Mais fort malheureusement, il faut noter que tout de même, le pays a été suspendu de la CITES en 2013. Et la majeure partie des pays de la sous-région connaissent la raison. C'est des manquements à des engagements constatés à travers des malversations opérées par des fonctionnaires. Donc, je veux parler de l'ancien organe de gestion qui a commis dans sa gestion à travers des émissions des permis CITES d'exportation des espèces intégralement protégées. Donc, le pays fut suspendu. Bon, euh, à quelques malheurs est bon, je peux dire ainsi, en bon français, parce que là, il y a eu le changement d'organe de gestion et il y a eu directement une proposition de formation sur le master. Donc, le pays n'a pas hésité. 
il fallait directement renforcer la capacité de point focal. Bien sûr, qui attendait au retour, qui avait une charge très lourde au niveau du pays, comment la Guinée peut retrouver son nom au niveau de la CITES à travers cette sanction. Donc, il y a eu cette formation de master, je vais vous dire, qui a été un renforcement de capacité au niveau national, la mise en relation de toutes les parties prenantes hein, impliquées dans la mise en œuvre de la Convention. Je veux appeler ici la justice, la douane, l'Interpol et le ministère de l'Environnement. Et c'est un problème très important parce que euh, les gens ignoraient la cité, en fait. Donc, l'État, à travers le ministère de l'Environnement, a nommé, en commun accord avec ses différents départements, des points focaux pour lancer carrément la lutte contre la criminalité des effets sauvages parce qu'on était reconnus comme une plate tournante. Donc, euh, c'était une formation qui était bienvenue à travers les différentes parties prenantes, l'Interpol, la, la police, la justice et nous autres. Il y a eu des formations des formateurs à travers Oabic, mais à travers Born Free, que non seulement à Dakar, il y a eu l'implication avec la douane qui pouvait, qui était le point nodal hein, sur le trafic. Il fallait que la douane soit impliquée fortement dans la lutte parce que tout s'est passé avec soit l'aéroport, port ou terrestre. Donc, il y a eu l'implication de la douane et le renforcement de la capacité de deux points focaux au niveau de la douane. Et il faut reconnaître aussi, il y a, à travers toutes ces luttes, d'où est venu le déclenchement, c'est l'évaluation des espèces en Guinée. À travers euh, Wabik, toujours borne Free, il y a eu cette mission qui a une grande envergure. On a sionné l'ensemble du pays pour évaluer les espèces et ça a attiré l'attention des autorités parce que la majeure partie, on a fait le tour et des musulmans, toutes les espèces étaient cachées dans les lieux. D'avion, si vous reconnaissez, si il y a 20 ans, 15 ans, vous prenez la voiture, vous rencontrez plusieurs espèces sauvages. Maintenant, après cette mission, on s'est posé la question où sont les espèces Ce qui veut dire qu'il y a une pression extraordinaire au niveau de ces espèces. Ce qui veut dire qu'il faut essayer. Dans, de renforcer la sensibilisation, l'information et la formation au niveau de toutes les parties prenantes, c'est-à-dire tout ce qui est structure étatique et non étatique. Là, l'État aussi, nous a, le ministère de l'Environnement, nous a beaucoup appuyé dans ce contexte. Et je veux revenir sur la formation très importante qui s'est passée au niveau de la Sierra Leone. Avec euh, l'ambassade britannique, on a eu une première réunion. Il y a eu, une, je pense, un, en parfaite collaboration avec les quatre ministres. Ils ont fait une déclaration qui a appuyé une formation de 20 rangers euh, guinéens qui avaient le Liberia aussi, il y avait la Sierra Leone, il y avait la Côte d'Ivoire et nous autres. Donc, euh, en Sierra Leone, au camp... Uh, we will come back to Mr. Mamadou Bella when the internet is working better. Um, but I think while waiting for de, that... De, de militaire, d'observateur. Et en place directement une... une... Donc, euh, dans le pays, dans chaque préfecture, il y a une unité préfectorale. Au niveau des régions, il y a une unité régionale. Donc, mais au point de vue faiblesse, il y a une insuffisance de sensibilisation. On a identifié à travers mon master même qu'il y a 18 préfectures qui ne sont pas sensibilisées. Et les critères de soi de ces 18 euh, préfectures, c'est du fait qu'il y a un, un approvisionnement des espèces, il y a plusieurs condamnations, et là, on a ciblé ces préfectures pour que ces acteurs-là, non étatiques et étatiques, soient sensibilisés. Voilà. Au Merci, point de vue des Diallo, a... je pense que vous avez peut-être juste le temps de faire le point, et puis nous pourrons continuer avec le prochain mm -hmm. panéliste. Voilà. Ce qu'il faut dire aussi, il y a eu cet apport de, de la législation, parce qu'il y avait une faiblesse au niveau de la mise en œuvre de la Convention, dont l'État a pris en charge de, de faire plusieurs arrêtés au niveau du ministère. La mise en œuvre de la Convention est un décret, les arrêtés de mise en place des organes de gestion, les organes de gestion autorités scientifiques, soit de l'espèce animale et végétale, et au niveau de l'espèce marine, au niveau de la pêche qui censure des autorités scientifiques. Au niveau de la CDAO, on a participé à la stratégie dont mon collègue vient de parler, d'un des orateurs. orateurs. Il y a eu des voyages aussi qui ont été financés à travers euh, l'ambassade britannique en appui à Mano Riva, le ministre de l'Environnement, plus les anciens ministres euh, à Londres. Donc, on a participé à cette conférence de lutte contre la criminalité fautive. Et je veux dire euh, en un mot de la synergie hein, de ces différents points focaux au niveau de l'Afrique de l'Ouest. Là, il faut saluer Wabik, 
Aujourd'hui, on est en contact avec ces différents pays, ces différents points Foucault. Nous discutons, nous échangeons. Et il y a eu une relation, il y a cet renforcement de relations professionnelles, sociales et scientifiques entre les points Foucault. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, Mamadou Bella. Um, we are going to invite Mr. Blamagol, having heard from the regional perspective and the national perspective. Uh, Blama, could you just tell us very briefly how um, biomonitoring in Liberia, Species Working Group contributed to achieving the mandate of the Liberia FDA? Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you to everyone. And I, I must appreciate and acknowledge WABIC, USAID, for all of the support given us, especially when it comes first to increasing our capacity for making sites to become more operational in Liberia because they were able to build, they were able to sponsor two our students and two our staff to go for the master's specific study on sites operations. And today they are now working and training other people to get the knowledge and be able to report uh, timely to CITES. But as for the what for the bar monitoring, WABIC has already also supported us highly. They have been able to give us committed a lot of funds to us through FFI and the Watch Pansy Foundation. We're able to develop our own term of reference for the operation of the bar monitoring group. And we're able to even say come up with strategy how we do bar monitoring at the various protected area. And it helped us to give a lot of information on the on the biological integrity of the various uh, protected areas, especially the, the one that were being impacted by Wabik, like the Wanagisi, you have the Gola, and you have the Global Crown and all our and SAPO. And you, we also were able to be privileged and supported by WABIC to join in the planning for with the, with the UK government to get some of our rangers to be further trained as a way of trying to handle illegal wildlife activities across the, in the transboundary areas or the landscape. Then we we work also on the WAPI initiative to develop our first national strategy for combating illegal wildlife crime and trade. And that has been drafted. It's only left to be validated. And that we I would say waiting to work with other people. And through the funding, we're able to also train over 75 state prosecutors. We work with Born Free and Wabic to do that and some magistrates and judges, as well as national law enforcement officers as a way of trying to operationalize sites and get them to support us in driving and operationalizing, implementing our wildlife and protected area management law. Then we, through that, we were able to do some decentralized training that also took place in Wanogisi and in and, 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 and Grand Gila and River G. We brought them together, cluster them together to have some training and for the officers, the national security officers, some local officials, the authorities like the superintendents and other people. And we did, we also worked over the years with and the various, with Wabic, it means with Wabic and Born Free to do threat assessment as a way of developing our, our societies guidebook for Liberia, of which we are using now to, to, to train other people and to know what the site species are and how do we go about looking at several parameters of sites when it comes to the, the listing and the delisting and it comes to also how do we uh, work with the custom officers as of monitoring our territorial bank and borders with the Liberia immigration services. And we have also been able to form the species working group that have been meetings on several occasions, several months to be able to share data on wildlife, on at the various protected area landscape and other adjacent forest areas. And we were able to form, to work with inner scene like 
to develop, to sign, to develop our can, can our you M2 just round MOUs. up in the interest of Actually, time, there were three MOUs, but two have been signed in the legal uh, framework with the with Guinea, we signed one legal framework on the MOU for managing the transboundary landscape. And we also signed another one that I, well, between Sierra Leone, the government of Sierra Leone and Liberia, of which is they are all been signed, but it, we are yet to pick up the activities of when it comes to implementation due to the COVID-19. But so far, I think we have been doing well with that, with all the kind of support they yeah, have to strengthen our collabor institutional collaboration and coordination because we were through that in the past, we have never been able to collaborate with the Ministry of Justice, but right now we have an agreement that has been signed between the Ministry of Justice and us. So the Ministry of Justice is now leading on most of the persecution of our illegal wildlife cases or where we have been able to become very successful in winning several cases within the court and, pre and prosecuting most of the, the violators or the poachers or some traders that were illegally trading wildlife as pets. So thank you, Blama. From can we, do you mind? Well, so we are only you mind just keeping that some of that for the question and answer. will bring more relief and will be able to use it to implement some of the strategy that were formulated so that it can become more user friendly and become more beneficial to the to the sector of Liberia and other transboundary landscape. So thank you so far. Thank you, Blama. I will hand the floor back to Emilia for the question and answer session. Very much, Michael. Um, I, I mean, obviously, uh, participants, you can attest that there's so much that has been done, so much that has been achieved within these five years of operation of WABIC that is very difficult to cut people to three minutes. So uh, people, uh, people have a lot to share. Anyway, participants, are there any particular questions you want to uh, address to any of these three panelists? So far, in the Q&A corner, we have three questions. Um, one is asking for uh, ECOWAS and MRU representatives, and we have not had those on this particular session. However, I believe that the question applies to, uh, is applicable to our ABC um, 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 uh, panelists. I mean, in, in, in Abu's uh, um, discussion, there's a comment he made and he said, you won't find this anywhere in the world. And he was referring to the sustainable resource management of mangroves named after Calabar. And I think that is such a powerful statement that I'm wondering whether we still have Abu and if Abu wants to speak to that some more, just a second. In the meantime, if you are a participant there and you have a question to this particular panelist, just click the raise hand button and I'll call you or go to the Q&A column and put it there. Alternatively, you can hold on to it. And when we come to the general Q&A conversation, you can bring it up. Abu, are you there to speak to this one more second? Okay, I think our brother Abu has gone on to other uh, things. In the meantime, um, it's just right about time to discuss the third panel, to have the third panel conversation. So the third panel conversation, which is the last panel for this uh, webinar is how WABIC leveraged proof of concepts to influence policy and legal reform and technical innovation. And to set the theme for this conversation is the chief of party, Stephen Kelleher. Stephen. Yes, thank you, Amelia, and good uh, afternoon or good morning, everyone. Um, interesting uh, panel so far, and I already can see for this one, we'll want to bring in uh, Blama and Dr. Tarawali, I think, to share um, 
and contribute to this one. Okay, again, this is, um, it's kind of on, what were some of the design elements of Wabic that were unique, uh, that, that have contributed to all of the things we've been hearing about? So we can go to the next slide. Who's doing slides? Okay. So just the snapshot, right? The overall goal while he presented this, improve conservation and climate resilient, low emissions growth across West Africa. Great. We have three core thematic, thematic areas. We've had webinars on these in the past, but by way of refresher, combating wildlife trafficking, increasing coastal resilience to climate change, and uh, reducing deforestation, forest degradation, and biodiversity loss. One of the elements of this that was quite, I thought, novel compared to my experience was assigned to work with three core regional partners, ECOWAS, the Minor River Union, and the Abidjan Convention. Not to mention, of course, all the national and local organizations we worked with, but these were identified in the WABIC design. Uh, another interesting element is the looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, not just in the learning la landscapes, but three transboundary forest landscapes. And, and I thought myself, wow, that is gonna be a challenge to do. We have language barriers, we have legal, different legal systems. Um, how is that going to work? And so what I'd like to do in this panel um, is to really kind of look at some of these kind of framework areas that I think facilitated uh, a lot of the other things we were hearing about uh, being able to come to fruition. So again, three regional partners forging interregional collaboration in areas of mutual concern. Now these three partners, uh, core partners of, of WABIX did not necessarily work all that closely together, but they did kind of build a relationship through our annual work planning processes and then saw the synergies they have in, in so many different areas. And I'd like to hear the perspective on that. And again, just this idea of trans, uh, transboundary forest management transforming this concept, which I think is very unique and very ambitious into reality. And as Blama was just leading off on, uh, there's some examples there. To, I think we'll go back Blama and look at those a bit more closely if we have the time. And then another thing I found, and my colleagues will laugh because all I could ever say that WABIC is a learning program, an explicit mandate to learn and to generate information, to inform policy, uh, and to inform practice so that these two important elements of development could really come together uh, for maximum benefit. And then across scale, so we have the geographical scales, very diverse ecosystems, institutions, regional, national, uh, civil society, et cetera. And then I'm just gonna leave this hanging there because people often ask me that, was WABIC integrated as a whole or did you work in silos? The quick answer is we weren't sure how this was gonna work out uh, going into WABIC, coming out of it, we see the integration as clear as the nose on our faces. Uh, they're, they're, it just happened that way. Organically, you, you, you couldn't not integrate. So on that kind of, with that uh, scene setting, I would like to call uh, initially on Director Buanu, uh, to, if he can share his experiences on, you know, this idea of the core regional partners working with ECOWAS, but not just ECOWAS, but getting ECOWAS together with the other core regional partners, uh, you know, of Abidjan Convention and MRU. And of course, doc, uh, Dr. Tara Wally, we'd love for you to be able to jump in on this one as well. So, uh, Director. Hello. Hello. Yes. 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 You hear me? Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you very much, uh, Stephen for this introduction. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been uh, a very uh, important and a great experience working as a regional core partners uh, with uh, uh, Wabik management and the team uh, working as the secretariat uh, and bringing us together as often as possible for a very important coordination activity. We've been in the region before Abik came. Abidjan Convention has been working uh, as an able, well-established body of the UN system, uh, UN Environment Program, and Mano River Union working uh, within uh, some of the ECOWAS member countries, uh, Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and uh, uh, the western parts of uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, on common interests. But 
uh, we in the Environment Directorate, we've been so much concerned about forest management, the landscapes, the coastal areas, and the impact of climate change and so on. But uh, our coordination uh, has been a challenge all along. So Wabi came on board uh, and uh, set a stage where we had the opportunity to be meeting very regularly, at least two important meetings a year uh, to, to plan activities for the upcoming year, and then to meet again to assess the achievements of the year. Uh, and uh, we, we, we have enjoyed this uh, opportunity for coordination amongst these three important regional bodies, working on natural resources within the region and uh, working on common interests for the benefit of our people. At least this uh, coordination experience uh, we can put our finger on that it has worked very, very effectively, and we are proud of it. Uh, that's what I can say. Uh, there are a lot of things that have gone on uh, that will impact policy. Uh, now, like uh, the mangroves, I thought Abu will answer, will be available to answer that question because they have been directly involved in the coastal mangroves uh, management and so on. And that uh, activities that have happened uh, within countries, within communities, will definitely impact on the national policies uh, within those countries. So we are very happy for this coordination and this opportunity. Thank you, Stephen. Great. Thank you, Director Johnson, for that clear um, input. And DSG Tarawale, um, as representing the Mana River Union, one of the other three core regional partners, I'm not sure if you would like to add any of perspectives from the MRU um, side. Yeah, I think my boss from the ECOWAS has said it all. You know, MRU is a subset of the ECOWAS. We are four country while the ECOWAS is fine. But one unique thing we learned, we've learned from the WABIC collaborative effort is in terms of bringing all these three institutions together in developing the annual work plan. They take into consideration the work plan of the MRU, the Abidjan Convention, the ECOWAS, and the mandate of the WABIC collates and have an harmonized work plan that they draw all these parties, these decisions together, we deliberate and then agree upon. To me, that's a big success and it shows the level of transparency on the side of WABIC to make sure that things go the right way. And another advantage to this is that it enables us to know what the other party is doing or what support WABIC is giving to the other party. Like for the MRU, this synergy, this collaborative effort give us an idea about the, the kind of relationship or work target between the, the WABIC and ECOWAS and what WABIC also does with Abidjan Convention. So we are able to know all these things. So to me, and then the last is the experience sharing. Whenever we meet for meetings or workshop, we share experience. We give success stories about what MR is doing, achievement, the role of WABIC towards the MR in terms of policy implementation, and the key challenges, and how we can mitigate some of these challenges to achieve our desired goal. And same goes to the Abidjan Convention and ECOWAS. So there is that kind of experience sharing during the meeting, and that has worked very well and very effective for the, for the success of WABIC. So for now, that's what I have to say. Tarawali, very, very beneficial and insightful. Thank you. I, I'll, I'll now like to move on to uh, another panelist uh, who we have here. It's Wab, uh, Victor uh, Mambu. Um, who is the USAID, he's the contracting officer's representative for WABIC. Uh, so um, he's in the unique position of, uh, he hadn't been so much involved with the design of WABIC, but certainly in these last years, he's really seen how the design that he inherited has, has kind of played out. And, and one of the things, Victor, uh, and Blama, I'd like to ask you to follow in on this, is this idea of the transboundary forest landscape management, which, which I, I think was very unique and kind of, a, I think while the designers really put this out as a, as a real challenge 
uh, to the countries and to the implementer to, to see that this happened. Uh, and from a natural resource management background yourself, you've had the chance to go to several of these landscapes, uh, to hike in, to attend some of the signing ceremonies. Anyway, um, what, what, what would be your kind of observations from uh, like the development agency on, on this particular concept of transboundary forest landscape management? Thank you, um, Stephen. Um, I think uh, stepping back just a little, uh, where we are now actually takes us back to um, the conceptual approach um, Wally presented in his opening remarks, which uh, basically is to say that regional policies and standards are only effective to the extent that they affect uh, local experience. Um, so that um, um, in looking at, um, in, in implementing a regional approach, it's important that we have a feedback loop between local level, national level, and the, um, and the regional level, um, so that what we are learning from the ground is providing knowledge and capacity as well for the national and uh, regional level. And it is in that uh, context that I would like to look at uh, how transboundary forest management, um, the experiences we have learned and how useful that will be uh, going forward. Like you clearly indicated, uh, is a lot of work working across countries dealing with uh, different governments, different uh, policies and, uh, um, and different languages in our, in our context. But we have, we've come quite far in that, in that experience and we have built the experience of how that, that works across uh, borders and, uh, and across uh, different, different languages. Um, and so um, going forward, I think it's important we think about uh, that in terms of how we are helping uh, um, countries to improve their own capacities and commitments um, in uh, biodiversity conservation and so on. Um, and all those experiences are useful for national level learning uh, as well. Uh, and so uh, such a unique experience um, and how, considering how difficult it could be, um, I think uh, we have done quite well in how far we've come uh, in the implementation of transboundary uh, forest activities. There is a story of how um, in the early 90s, when there was an unrest in Togo, then the wildlife officers in Ghana observed that there was suddenly a lot of bush meat in the eastern part of Ghana. And when it was investigated, it realized, they realized the um, people were overrunning one of the um, forest reserves in Togo and all the animals were running into Ghana. And as they run in, they are tired and they, they just become local targets for uh, local people to kill. And that then raised the question of if Ghana had a, a, a reserve on that side of the border, the animals would have just found safe refuge as they run across. So these are practical examples uh, that uh, should inform um, the need to continue to work uh, to improve transboundary uh, forest, uh, because we are looking at shared resources, um, wildlife, watershed, and so on. And so um, looking at things only at national level um, will let us miss the, the linking pieces. And uh, those who live in Northern Ghana are very aware of how when it rains a lot in Burkina Faso, uh, their farms get destroyed. So. These interlinkages between countries um, should continue to inform our efforts um, in pushing for transboundary um, resource management. I think I will pause here for another person to take over or for questions to come. Thank you. But could I come in, Stevie, or the yes. group? Yes, please, quickly. Okay, I think the transboundary 
uh, management framework agreement has helped us to share some cultural value and also help us to learn from other countries what they are doing best and borrow from them of what can work for us and be able to adapt to Liberia. And at the same time, they borrow from, from us and take back. Like example, they, even though we have language barrier when it comes to like the Francophone and the Anglophone, but that cannot stay deterred or from working together. And that was proven quite recently when the elephant crossed over from the from Zedekode, from the from the night from the from the forest area there, the protected area. And Wata Mana Wata Watara Wata Tamara were very much influential. And she contacted me immediately with begun working and were able to get at the rangers and other community dwellers as well as the journalists all around covering the story and making the law enforcement people to work together so that we can protect or conserve the elephant that crossed over to Liberia. And that was very much good because we sustained it up to the end when the elephant went back to Guinea. And that was somehow a learning event because the Guinean were able to send some of the rangers from the forest and they were able to come and learn something that we are, we are doing better here especially when it comes to community engagement. How do we engage the community? And they were at the end of the, their tour, when we went to meet them, they were able to tell us that they wanted to borrow from us those kind of new ideas, how do we do it? Because that is strange for them because they are not used to doing that. So we, we learned a lot of things, even sharing some information, especially as it relates to threats, transboundary threats and trying to see how we can harmonize some of the policies that we can that is existing in both countries and other countries. I think that was another learning experience and we brainstormed and we came up with how we can forge ahead and manage the transboundary landscape just like development of that transboundary legal framework agreement and the MOU because we all had a common point. We, we look at every, uh, everything we wanted to do and we all review it and decided to come out to one plan and to see how we can coordinate okay. and collaborate. And that was another thing that strengthened us for better transboundary and, and patrol and other coordination and sharing information at the very landscape. Thank you very much, uh, Blama. Uh, I think this is the time where we move on to the general queue. Um, can I have the questions up the screen? And thank you all very much. For this and thank Emilia, you. Uh, Emilia, I would I would like to just stop. I know I know we're going a bit over, but the the learning element of Wabic I think is key. And if we could just get two minutes from Victor again on you know how how has the learning that's been generated through WABIC on different levels. I mean, how does USAID see that as, again, like a model? Has it worked? Has it not? Has it been beneficial? Because again, our mandate was to generate knowledge and learning. And Victor, if you have a couple minutes on that, I'm sure that our moderator would. Um... Absolutely. Uh, it goes to form part of this fact anyway. Yes, that, that's right. I think we can, uh, we've, already spoken a bit on uh, the Abidjan protocols and starting from um, the um, climate change vulnerability assessments that were that was conducted, which then fed into the coastal climate change adaptation plan for Sierra Leone and fed into the Abidjan convention protocols, the protocol on uh, uh, sustainable mangrove uh, management. I think that is um, a very good example of how uh, this model has worked. And the protocol we have now can be, can be ap um, applied widely across uh, various coastal countries. Um, and so that's a very good example of how uh, uh, this, this model, model has worked. We can look at uh, other examples in terms of uh, 
trans the work that happened in a uh, the 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 upland forest areas, the transboundary uh, landscapes, and how uh, that is uh, has helped to inform uh, the the work that we we have going on at ECOWAS, especially the uh, formation, the development of the ECOWAS um, Environmental Action Plan, um, and we are happy that that uh, process has now come to a close. Now that becomes a a regional framework from which. Uh, we can inform uh, national level um, environmental processes and um, going back to uh, local level uh, implementation. And so um, clearly we, uh, the local level experiences have helped to build um, knowledge and capacity at regional level um, um, as um, Director Johnson and uh, Director, Dr. Tarawili and Abu Bamba have uh, already spoken to um, in today's uh, webinar. We can also look at the, the, the work we've done with the, um, in trying to combat uh, wildlife crime um, in the region. And um, starting from the, uh, the trade assessments that were conducted and how uh, that informed um, uh, national level trainings and other capacity building efforts, including uh, the um, CITES master's program in which 26 persons from around the region uh, benefited from. And all that information then informed the, the drafting of the West Africa strategy uh, for combating uh, wildlife crime. We are looking forward to the final finalization of that document actually. I think technically it is done. It's not led with ministerial approval. And um, all countries can now draw from from that framework and working together, uh, ECOWAS will be in a good position to coordinate the, the national and local level efforts at uh, combating wildlife crime uh, within the region. So um, I think we have learned largely how we can get this done. Uh, we can get this regional approach uh, working um, on all fronts in terms of the various components uh, Wabik has implemented uh, over the period. Um, and so I think we are all now in a very good place to uh, take this forward and uh, be more impactful at regional level to protect biodiversity um, and our coastal areas. Right, thanks, thanks Victor very much. And I'll turn it over to Emilia to begin the wrap up. Thanks very much. Thank Welcome. you very much all of you and um, Victor, your, your, your statement that you just made is almost like the response to the person who asked, when is Wabik 2 coming? Because I was hearing a, a justification for Wabik 2 in the statement that you just made, Victor. Thank you very much. Now, can I have the question tab? We have to honor uh, people who have questions. So there are four questions there. Can I have the questions up quickly? And we start responding to them, please. Um, so for our ECOWAS or MRU representatives, what role do field level demonstrations play in helping to form national or regional policies? Are they worth investing in? One question. Second question, in a bid to build on the work WAPIC, what is or are the main actions you will report comment as next step for MDAs in Sierra Leone. And the third question is, given the support the project has given the MRU, how can the MRU take ownership and replicate amongst its members in the absence of WABIC to ensure sustainability? Any WABIC rep there can take, or anybody who can speak to the uh, MRU issues should take the first and third points together quickly, please. And it's actually three o'clock time we should be ending. But let's take a couple of questions and then we can uh, wrap up. So any people there to answer the MRU ECOWAS questions? Can I respect you for yeah, the, the third and then I will allow my boss to answer the one for the ECOWAS. I will take the third and then I will allow my boss, Dr. Wano, to take the first question. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of... The third question, 
Despite the fact that Wabik is trying to wrap up, MRU is an intergovernmental institution and keeps needs to keep going and functioning. And most of the activities or the policies or the instruments or the support given to the MRU will continue. Like I failed to mention one major important aspect that uh, Wabi contributed to the MRU does to improve on our financial reporting from, from the IFRS to the IPSAS. That's a one big achievement and that's very key for, for donor partner support because it ensures transparency in the management of our financial resources. And that has gone a long way for us to get more donor partners. In fact, last week, the ADB approached the MRU to work on the blue economy. We are trying to develop a proposal to worth almost $4 million to work on the blue economy. So with the IPSAS, it has given a wider coverage for other donor partners to come on board and work with MRU to ensure, to, since there is transparency in, the, in our financial reporting. And another thing is that in terms of our strategic plan, Wabik also came up with a new issue that, though it is within our mandate, but we never thought of, that is the resource management, management of natural resources. And that's key to the Wabik vision. And that has been taken on board. And now we are having different donor partners who are bent on working with the MRE to advance the natural resource management of natural resources. And in terms of landscape biodiversity, despite the fact that Wabik is trying to wrap up, there is also the IUCN that we are closely working with in order to ensure that there is continuity in, in the process. So by and large, member states have also taken on board most of the issues that we've done with, the, uh, with Wabik in terms of the communication strategy, in terms of the border, joint border surveillance management. If you recall, or if you follow development, yesterday or the day before, the president of Guinea and the president of Sierra Leone signed a joint communique to open the border and to also strengthen the border security, joint border security and confidence building management in order to ensure border patrol across the, two, the, the, the border post. One is to uh, avoid illegal trafficking of wildlife and two, to also monitor this coronavirus and the outbreak of Ebola. So among others, it also has that component that Wabik brought on board. So despite Wabik is folding up, their activities and their process and their programs is still ongoing and will stand the test of time. And we'll always continue to talk about Wabik when we talk about our strategic plan. We'll also continue to talk about Wabik. We are also developed on the verge of preparing for, for a donors or a partners conference. And that again was the handy work of Wabik to develop a resource mobilization strategy. And we are using that framework to as a benchmark to, to prepare for a donors conference. And that again, Wabik will be key. So it's a continuous process and Wabik will live on. It, though it's, it will be gone, but it will remain a living organism. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, um, Director Buono, um, as you give your response on the ECOWAS front, could you also mention one key factor you consider as a success in the collaboration so that our Central Africa brothers can, and sisters can learn from as they also start to work with regional organizations? And please take that as part of your closing statement from ECOWAS. Thank you, Director Bueno. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, I think I initially uh, did some brief uh, remark on that um, experience on uh, what our work, the impact of our work on the national uh, regional policies. Uh, I also want to emphasize that an important word we shouldn't forget is ownership. Ownership of a policy or a strategy. Uh, it may interest you to know that during the process of development of the regional wildlife strategy, we did not go the norm, the usual way 
that we've been going to look for a consultant who may even come from outside the region. We rather mobilized uh, experts from the uh, West African countries, some of who were part of the uh, students who were trained at master's level by the Wabik project. And they were brought together to Abuja to stay here for some days to bring ideas from all the countries for us to, from the scratch, develop the regional wildlife strategy. And we've taken it through various levels of adoption. And as at now, as uh, Victor uh, mentioned, it is at the foot of the ECOWAS Council of Ministers and then to the heads of states for endorsement. If you uh, are, are the director uh, of wildlife in Sierra Leone or in the Senegal, and the ideas you have contributed are adopted by your head of state, and it is now back at your level to implement, definitely you feel so proud and to make sure that it impacts on the national level policy. That is the ownership level we are talking about. And uh, it was similar to the ECOWAS um, um, adopted uh, document uh, on the environmental action plan. All the regional uh, institutions came together to put ideas together for us to review it. And it has gone through to the heads of states level. It has been adopted by and endorsed by heads of states. So the implementation at the national level uh, to impact on national policies and national, uh, regional, uh, I mean, local level activities to, 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 to address environmental uh, challenges and impacts. It's a very real practical thing that is happening. Uh, we are just about taking uh, delivery of the uh, printed copies of the environmental action plan for distribution to the member states and relevant institutions. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to give these two examples of the essence of ownership and getting involved uh, the countries to develop policies at the regional level, get them adopted for them to impact at the local level, at the national level, uh, to address practical things that have been expressed by the people who are on the ground within the countries. I think this is what I can say. These are two key examples uh, that we can talk about. There are others, in fact, at the country level, a lot of them of policies have been developed strategies, uh, action plans that they brought NGOs, CSOs together for them to contribute their experiences to develop these national uh, strategies and uh, action plans that will get back to them for implementation. And for that matter, uh, the ownership will be well reflected. Thank you very much, Madam. And uh, thank, thank you, the person who posed the question. Thank you, Director Bueno, and I take that that in all of that is your closing statement as well. Uh, the, the, if it's the closing statement, then you have cut me short because we need to actually uh, appreciate those who have brought us. Okay, so you level. have one minute, Director, to do your closing statement. Uh, a closing statement, one minute. Yes. Definitely, I cannot do a closing statement well, without... You give chance to others to also do their closing statement one minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, okay. Um, definitely, the distinguished officials of USAID here present and far and near, uh, Tetra Tech officials, Wabik team, uh, Wabik officials, the management, and our colleagues, the partner regional organizations from Mano River Union, uh, Abidjan Convention and all other institutions and experts who have worked with us for the past five years. Uh, we are very grateful to you. Uh, it has been a very good five years uh, since we started. Uh, we recall when in 2014, when uh, Nico, Nico uh, Chamo uh, is a Cameroonian, he was working with the USAID. Uh, he came down with Andix, who was the head of the Environment, Direct Environment Department in USAID Regional Office in Accra. 
They came, spent three days with us for us to put our ideas together, what ECOWAS aspirations are and what the US government's intentions are towards supporting to improve upon uh, biodiversity conservation uh, within Africa and for the West African region. And that was the genesis of the birth of WABIC uh, project. From there, we have actually worked as a team that has given us opportunity to be interacting, as I mentioned, annually to uh, share views and discuss uh, to make sure that our regional and national level institutional ABC, um, Abidjan Convention, Mano River Union, ECOWAS, and other regional organizations, the views they have been expressing can be collated to fit into what WABIC is doing. And that was what we have done for the past five years. We feel so much elated that we have come to this stage looking at where we started from. And uh, in my view, uh, we cannot go without expressing on behalf of the ECOWAS Commission uh, and uh, on behalf of our ECOWAS Environmental, uh, Environment and Natural Resources uh, Department, uh, express our appreciation to the US government and all the people who have contributed to bring us this far. We have been very hopeful uh, and have been expressing annually or at various levels, uh, the foundation we are laying, where will it lead us to? What are our hopes when WABIC comes to an end? And I thought, or I believe somebody, maybe Victor will give us an idea what is expected from here. WABIC, we, we know is closing within some few uh, days from now or a week and something from now. I'm not to announce the time, but uh, the appropriate officers will announce the time and what is in view for us. We are very hopeful that we cannot close WABIC and then that will be the end. Yes, there is sustainability activities. A lot will definitely continue, but there is the need for the opportunity to continue this coordination and to have more impact uh, on the grounds so that uh, uh, we will have this thing, this, these activities well established. We are once again very, very grateful to our partners, Abu Bamba, uh, the Abidjan Convention, uh, the UNEP officials, and the Mano River Union in particular, having uh, worked in synergy with us on all these things. We strongly believe that we will have opportunity to continue this family coordination work in the very, very near future. Uh, Madam Coordinator, this is my, uh, what I can tell you. And if I'm giving the small one, one, no, not even one minute. I want to indicate that possibly the date that Wabik will be closing, uh, I will also officially be bowing out of ECOWAS on retirement but I will be available within the region to continue to work. Uh, colleagues retired and they have been working uh, for the region. And I believe I will be available to continue. God will give me the strength to continue to work within the region. Uh, at the end of this month, if I will communicate uh, by what, uh, what I mean, by mail to as many of you as possible uh, by God's grace of my retirement. Thank you very much, Madam. Thank you very much, Director. When it's yeah. always, always, always fun. In Sips and see, this is a vote of thanks on behalf of ECOWAS, Abidjan <laughs> Convention, and MRU. Yes, thank you. So you are done. Let me just say just one sentence, one minute, because I have another, I'm trying to rush for another meeting. Maybe on behalf of the Secretary General Management and staff of the Mano River Union, I want to say a big thank you to the management and staff of Wabik, especially Stephen, Wally, Michael, and Pedia, who has left them long ago. We had a very cordial, good working relationship. Though along the line, there was, the road was bumpy, but we were able to weather the storm. It has been a very good experience working with Wabik. And our prayer, we keep praying day in, day out, that 
USAID will consider Tetra Tech for the second phase of the Wabinec, and we hope and pray that it comes to reality because this team is a good team to work with. It's, they have the technical know-how, they have the expertise, they have the humor, the human relation to coordinate well with all and sundry. And we also thank ECOWAS and the Abidjan Convention for a cordial working relationship over these years. And we pray that Wabi 2 will come back with Tetra Tech taking the lead. Once again, on behalf of the Secretary General, I want to say thank you to Wabi, Steven, Wale, Michael, and Co. And to you, the presenter, the, the host, I want to say a big thank you. You manage your time so well. And to our, to Dr. Wano, yeah, you are retired, but you are not tired. You'll be very active within the sub-region as a consultant. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, um, if I have now, I have another meeting. Can I take my leave now, please? I have another meeting. Yes, Am you may okay. leave. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you, okay. Dr. Tarawale. So, so <laughs> can I now invite um, Victor, representing USAID, to give us his closing statement? Victor. Um, thank you, Emilia, and um, congratulations to uh, Director Johnson. I wish you a happy retirement. You still look strong, so I'm sure we'll continue to see you around, like how we continue to see uh, Dr. Wally around. So we have now come to the end in a series of webinars to share lessons um, from the Wabic experience. We have done, as I yesterday, five years and exactly nine months in this experience. And in the next two weeks or so on the 28th day of February, the Wabic program will officially come to a close. So this really is our last time together. Over the period, we have worked together to generate a lot of information to inform and to influence policy. And in a way, we approach biodiversity conservation and tackle climate change in West Africa. We have improved capacities uh, of individuals and institutions in critical sectors. And we are all now in a better place uh, than before to deal with the challenges of illegal wildlife trade, uh, deforestation and forest degradation and protection for critical plant and uh, animal species um, in key landscapes uh, within the region. I really want to emphasize uh, that what we have achieved uh, through the Wabic initiative has largely been possible because of the partnerships and collaborations that have worked, particularly the partnership and the leadership of the ECOWAS Commission, uh, but also of the Mano River Union and the Abidjan Convention. Uh, and of course, the landscape partners, the uh, Wild Chimpanzee Foundation, Fauna and Flora International, uh, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, and the many NGO collaborators, local NGO collaborators, and of course, our USAID partners uh, in the bilateral missions and uh, our colleagues in Washington, DC. This indeed has been a collaborative effort and an example of what uh, we can achieve if we uh, set up right partnerships and work together. But for these partnerships and collaborations, we probably would have achieved very little from March 2020 to date, when various countries locked their borders due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But because we are many and working together in various places, work continued to happen on the ground, and we have suffered very little um, in terms of COVID-19 uh, setback. I think the real work uh, now begins, as Director Johnson uh, will put it. Uh, the practice, the, the work to put to practice the many policies and strategies uh, now begins. And we look forward to working together uh, to operationalize many of these policies, uh, such as the wildlife strategy for combating wildlife crime, uh, the West Africa strategy for combating wildlife crime, and the ECOWAS Environment Action Plan, the bilateral agreements for the management of uh, various transboundary landscapes, uh, among others. I just want to say a big thank you to uh, 
Stephen, uh, for your incredible leadership uh, through this period. And to the rest of the Wobbic team who are now scattered about in various countries. And of course, uh, those in the home office in the US. I just want to thank all of you for uh, the effort you have put in this process um, and the results we have achieved over the period. Uh, when I look at uh, the various documents that we have produced over the period, it's just incredible. There is so much information we have generated over the period. And as we all keep saying, we have laid a very good foundation. And of course, if we were to leave it at that, it will amount to uh, nothing. It will mean we've just learned a lot uh, for nothing. Um, and so, yes, um, we, we are not going anywhere. We will continue to be around. Um, we are working very hard to make sure uh, we continue to work together. Um, and I am hoping that in the next couple of months, uh, what some of you may call what big two, um, we should have it happening. Uh, very hopefully. Let's all keep our fingers crossed and let's keep praying. And then in the next couple of months, hopefully, uh, we should have that uh, happening. Thank you very much. And uh, I wish you a very happy day. Uh, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, um, uh, uh, panelists. Thank you, scene setters. And thank you, uh, participants, especially those who have still stayed with us up to this time, though we are like 15, 20 minutes of our time that we should have closed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what's this webinar, final webinar of WABI, um, uh, hopefully have been able to present to you is a, a way of working, a system of working that yields results, that at the end of the day, everybody sees themselves in the process and everybody can own how the results were uh, achieved and everybody feel that there is a needed next phase um, to this. And the framework within which the panel conversations have been held have been to identify issues, describe the processes that were used, determine the products that came out as a result of the processes, and then the results and the outcomes that have come out. So be it working in Liberia or Sierra Leone or the entire uh, sub-region, uh, be it working through ECOWAS or Abidjan Convention or MRU, or be it addressing coastal issues or, or um, combat wild, combating wildlife crime. For me, the things that have come out from this discourse is that you need one to have the right partnerships and at different levels. So what right partnerships, as in this case, with the regional partners, but also at the local level through the grantee organizations or through local government actors or through traditional authorities. You need to identify the right partnerships and WAPIC did that very, very well. You need to have the right team to work with at different levels. And in all the commentary that has gone on, you would have heard that coming out very clearly. But also importantly is the fact that you need to have a systemic and structural approach to work. You need to create ownership so that today, uh, uh, ABC can say, Abidjan Convention can say, that more money is coming into Abidjan Convention as a result of the institutional capacity that um, was facilitated by WABIC. And also importantly, you need to measure impact. You need to capture, package, and share your success stories. And WABIC has done that very well. I am hopeful that this would provide many learnings and many lessons for the new project that is coming up if it does come up. But also importantly, for all those who want to start working differently in the Africa region, because what WABIC did was to work differently. And it shows that when you work differently, creatively, you actually do get amazing results. Thank you all very much once again. And um, bye WABIC, <laughs> bye participants. I hope that we get a chance to have a conversation another time. Thank you all and bye-bye. Thank you, bye, bye. bye everyone. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you, Bye bye. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.